Hey y'all, that's something a little bit different today. Let me turn you around and show you what I'm working on here. This is a little Norwegian spinning wheel. This belongs to a friend of my wife's. She's one of her spinning students. And she had this cute little wheel that she inherited through her family. Near as we can figure, it came to the West Coast around the Horn sometime in the late 1800s. For obvious reasons, this style of wheel is referred to as a super slanty because of the slanted deck on it right here. And what that's for is, that's to allow them to use that big drive wheel to get a lot of twist into the yarn that's being made without taking up a huge footprint. You can imagine if that deck was, or table, was level, it would spread everything out. So by putting it on a slant like that, it just makes for a smaller footprint. The problem comes in with this treadle. And as you can see, it has seen better days. The lady doesn't want this restored just yet, although I have recommended that she do so. And you can see somebody has tried to start stripping it. And, uh, you know, which is kind of a shame, actually. Uh, we have found the maker's mark on it down here. And I found a photo of one that was very similar by the same maker, but we still haven't been able to identify who that maker is. Near as we can tell, this is from about the mid-1800s. So it's well over 160 years old, probably closer to 170. So back to the treadle. She wanted me to see if I could make her a new treadle for this poor little wheel. She wants to get it back into spinnable condition. So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to make a pattern using the pieces that I have there. I'm going to scan that pattern into the computer. I'm going to import it into a spire, then clean up those vectors cut a new one on the CNC router. So if you want to see how I got that done, stick around. This is the treadle of the wheel, pretty much the way I received it. I've got these little brads sticking up out of here. This is where everything was located when I received it. And you know, you can basically see what I'm dealing with here is pretty much just residue. I've got a couple of pieces of the treadle, and as they were placed in the wheel when I got it, they're not where they belong. This was basically done to kind of sort of make it operational. I have recommended to the owner of this little wheel that she go ahead and get a full restoration done on it, but that's not what I'm working on right now. She just wants me to make it operable, so that's what we're going to do. When I finally got these pieces of treadle off, I came across these holes here in the treadle and these little holes here in the members where the treadle mounts. So I've got these here. When I took it apart and got the treadle off, I found that there were broken pieces of these pegs still buried in these holes. So I was able to use those to figure out exactly where this treadle went. So I have this hole up here, this hole up here. I went ahead and stuck the peg into the hole, got it all lined up, and I knew that that's where this went. Same thing up here. I have this peg hole and then this peg hole here. And doing much the same thing, was able to place this together. Now I can see the wear patterns here in the treadle as it's supposed to be. I can also come along and place a peg in this hole and where it went in, I know I have that piece placed. Now this one here, it's, it's gone. It's just there is no more wood down here it was worn off that badly. But that tells me that this was at one time one piece. 
I also know that by finding a photograph of a similar wheel made by the same maker, which I'll put up now, and that confirmed that the treadle was supposed to be one piece. Basically, what I was able to do was find that photo, see how this treadle was supposed to look, and then use my better judgment as far as making a pattern is concerned. I know that this treadle fit in something like this. It was not a perfect fit. There's got to be room for expansion and contraction as the seasons change. And the same thing over here. This piece, you can see that the wood has broken off here. So I'm going to have to guess at a shape. This is completely worn away and just gone. So I have to guess over here as well. I can see that this is the old paint and the old finish in here. And the same with around here. So I know it went in this direction and then came down this way, but here's where the old paint end. So I have to guess at this as well. And the way I did that was by, again, looking at that photo and kind of taking a little bit of artistic license in this and figuring out what would look nice. Now I can start making the pattern that I'm going to use to scan into the computer and hopefully cut a new treadle with this. And the only tools I'm going to use will be some just plain old masking tape or painter's tape, whichever you prefer, and some heavier paper. Now this is uh, the glossy card stock that you use to print up posters and flyers on and what have you. But just about anything I wouldn't use corrugated cardboard, that's a little heavy, but anything like this that can be used to fill in spots is a, a workable alternative. I'll get my gap about centered, then I'll start taping it together. Just putting pieces of tape here to bridge this gap, keep them the set distance apart that they're supposed to be, and I can feel in this wear pattern that I'm on the right track. Put that there, then come along and fill in the middle. So now I have these two connected together in what should be their proper location, their proper orientation. So now what I'll do from here is I'll come out and I'll start fleshing out these areas where there is no material. Now it's just a matter of taking bits and pieces of cardboard and fleshing it out. So I'll start up here. I need a thin spot that's going to clear this peg and this angle. So I'll take a thin piece about like so, come along and slip it up underneath line it up with that tape edge right there and now I can start taping it down. For that I'll use narrower tape and I'll just go around the perimeter using tape and cardboard to more or less pad out this pattern and figure out where I want to cut, where I need to fill and using what's available, what is here, and trying to fill in what is not. And for some reason, I'm deciding to make everything either too big or too small today. But that's all part of pattern making. As long as you have scissors and tape, you can make a pattern. This is the beginnings of how I made that pattern. I'll then pick this whole thing up, flip it over, and I start taping everything down from the back. So you can see how it kind of looks like a jumbled mess, 
but it will get everything done as we need it. And I'll have to put this back down and pick it up and put it back down and fit and play with it and fiddle with it some more. Then I can lift the whole mess up and we can start working with the pattern itself. That's the beginnings of the pattern. Okay, with the pattern more or less filled out, I can kind of start playing in here and figuring out where I need to flesh out and where the treadle, the good wood, still exists. And I can carve away and just basically clean up the entire thing. Let me get you set up here and I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, this is one of the easier parts of doing the job here in that all I'm going to do is go around, use a straight edge to continue some lines, use a pencil, scissors, an X-Acto knife, whatever I need to come around and figure out what part of the pattern I need to remove. Like right now, I know I need to get rid of this part of the pattern here. So I can come in and mark it, then come back with my scissors and just trim that away. But I don't need this at all. And also, something to remember is we're going to be scanning this into the computer and the software will let me to adjust these lines so they don't have to be 100% spot on perfect. I can come in here with an X-Acto knife and trim that away, get in here without getting my hands in the way. I can kind of bring that around here, but trim down this paper and any tape that happens to be behind it, get a nice clean edge without damaging the wood and without messing up the pattern I already have created. So that's nice and clean there. With the wheel back up on the bench, I'm now going to mark all of my mounting holes in the pattern in these areas where no peg holes were on the uh, pattern itself or on the wood that I had left over itself. I've got it put back up here into place with these two pegs. I'll go ahead and peg this one as well since I have one handy. And now I'm going to bring in another tool. These are called transfer punches. And what they are is they're a, they're set up in various diameters. They are a more or less a solid metal drift with a sharp point right in the center here. And they're made for dropping down a hole of specific diameter or pushing up through a hole then just tapping so that that point leads a mark. So you transfer the center of the hole this fits in to the center of your proposed hole that you're going to be drilling. They come in various sizes and generally speaking they come in 20 to 30 piece kits, although you can buy them individually for whatever size you need. Now I'll leave a link in the description box below to the set I use with my uh, transfer punches here, I'm going to kind of guesstimate as to what size I think these holes might be. Now, I'm not going to come in from these holes here because they may be a little bit worn. I'm going to come up from the bottom, from underneath, and poke the mounting holes through this crossbar and this crossbar here. That way I'm sure I get the right size hole in the right location on the pattern where no hole up here in the wood exists. OK, 
okay with all all of the mounting holes now marked i can lift this off i'm now ready to lay this out on paper and trace it and the first thing i'll do is i'll go back get my transfer punch and i'll come along and transfer these marks down onto this paper Now I've got those holes transferred. I can go ahead, take my pencil, and just trace both along the wood and the edge of my cardboard down here to pad out where I have added to the pattern. With that taken care of, I can now lift this up. Again, I can just guess down here and up here. And then I'm going to circle my mounting holes here just for my attention. The little spots here where the transfer punch poked through, those will be scanned. So I won't have to concern myself with that. But here is my preliminary tracing. Now I'm going to go in, clean this up just a little bit, trace it with a Sharpie, and cut this paper a little bit shorter so it'll more easily go through my scanner. Okay, I went through and kind of cleaned up the pattern a little bit, traced it with my Sharpie so that you can see it a little easier and so the scanner can read it a little easier. I went ahead and I did a little bit of a artsy touch down here just in case I do get the entire length of this in my scan, but I'm not going to hold my breath on it. Uh, suffice it to say that this is now ready to run through my scanner so that I can scan it into a JPEG, then import that into VCarve or Aspire, and we'll do a standard bitmap trace and clean up these vectors. Now, I'm not going to show you the scanning process because every software for every scanner is a little bit different, and my scanning software and my scanning procedure may be a little bit different than what you do. Again, if you don't have a scanner, you can take this paper template that we've just made down to an Office Depot, Office Max, or any of the other office supply shops, and they'll be able to scan this for you into a JPEG for a nominal fee, usually not more than a dollar or two. So let's go ahead. I'll get this scanned in off camera, and we'll pick this up over at the software. With my pattern scanned into the computer and saved as a JPEG, I'm now ready to come over here to Aspire or VCarve and import that bitmap to start the bitmap trace and creating usable vectors. Again, in the interest of full disclosure, I have already done this, and this is the completed design with toolpaths ready to cut. Now I'm going to show, show you how I got to this point. So we'll go back over to this new session of Aspire. And I'll go into job setup here. This is a single sided job. My job size is 16 inches wide in X, 9 inches high in Y. The treadle is somewhere between a half inch and 7 sixteenths of an inch. When you count all the wear, I went ahead and I made it a full half inch thick. I'm going to set my Z0 at the material surface. And because I'm going to have a lot of work out here, a lot of layout work, I'm setting my XY datum to the center. Before I calculate the toolpaths, I will change this to the bottom left. Because again, that's where I set my XY and Z0 outside on the machine. Modeling resolution is irrelevant because this is a 2D part, and again, the modeling resolution only affects 3D models. 
we'll go ahead and click OK. And now I'm ready to import my bitmap for tracing. So we'll come up here to this icon, Import Bitmap. There is my scan. So I'll double click that to load it. And there we have our scan. Now, just looking at it, we can tell there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done here because we've got a broken area down here. So this is going to be a vector. This is going to be a separate vector when we come along and do the trace. So let's go ahead and do that now. We'll, with the bitmap selected, we'll come over here under Create Vectors to Trace Bitmap. And we want to select black and white. My corner fit, I'm going to leave all of these settings here as they are, except maybe I'll bump up my noise filter to about 6. I'm going to leave the fading alone. I do not want to group the vectors, so I'll uncheck that. That way I can go in and edit individual vectors without having to ungroup them. And we'll preview that and see what we get. And as I thought, we're going to have, you know, an open gap here. There are going to be some artifacts in here that we'll have to get rid of, but that's not a problem. And we're going to have to do quite a bit of cleanup work here. I'm going to go ahead and apply and accept that as it is. Then we'll close that. Now immediately what I'm going to do is come up here and I'm going to turn off my bitmap layer. That shuts off the JPEG image so I don't have that in the background. Now because I selected or deselected that check mark in the group vectors uh, option, if I click on this here, you can see we've got a bunch of little artifacts from the scan. But these are all separate vectors. It's not grouped. I can take care of a lot of the problems without ungrouping anything. So the first thing I'll want to come along and do is I want to get rid of all of these little artifacts like that one right there. So what I'll do is I'll draw a box starting from left to right. So I'll click up here drag that down around like so and what that does is that selects everything that was within that box so if I come up here and look I've got a few little pieces of vectors a few artifacts from the scan that are selected and I can just hit delete and those are gone and I'll kinda of go around and follow this vector all the way around like such just selecting all of the little artifacts that are within this vector that are not connected to the vector. And I'm making sure to leave my holes alone. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to open this up. We What we need to remember is we traced around the outline of the pattern. So I'm not interested in this outer vector at all. I need this inner vector. The inner vector followed the shape of my pattern. The outer vector is just the width of my, the tip of my Sharpie. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to open these up. And for that, we'll have to go into node editing. So I'll select it. And I'll type the letter N on my keyboard. And oh boy, look at all of the uh, nodes we have. What I'm going to do next is come in here and I'm going to put my cursor over this point right here on the corner. Right click, cut vector. Then I'll zoom back out. Go over to the other end of this vector and zoom back in. And then just, I'm going to select one here at random. It doesn't really matter which one. I'll put my cursor over this one. Right click and select cut vector. It's separated this inner vector from this outer vector. And just by chance, the 
outer vector happens to be selected. That's the one I want to get rid of. So I'll just click, I'll just hit delete on my keyboard, and that outer vector is gone. So I'm left with just the outline right around real close to where we traced. And now I'm going to do the same up here. Now I'm going to right click to come out of note editing for a moment here and take a look at what I have. I have a very ragged set of vectors here that we're going to have to clean up. Now you could come in, go into note editing and start cleaning up all of these lines here. I'll select it, type N to go into node editing. But this would be a monumental waste of time to go in and try to adjust these handles, delete points, and salvage these vectors as they are. Because right now these are basically unusable. It would be a much more efficient use of our time to come in and redraw these vectors using this as our guideline. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a combination of draw a straight line, draw curves, and draw circles to replace these vectors with new ones. So let's go ahead and start just arbitrarily. We might as well start up here close to the top. We want a straight line here. The entire reason for scanning this in was to get this shape so we have something to follow. We are not going to be able to follow this 100%, nor do we actually want to. We're going to use this, these vectors as our limits while we create new vectors and along the way delete these. So we'll start by drawing a straight line. And I'm going to come over here to this corner. I don't have to be super, super accurate here. But I'm going to come in at about this point and click. Then I'll bring my line up here to about this point. I want to go beyond these vectors so that it overlaps. And I'll click again. Now that ends that segment of the line. I'll hit my space bar and then back out. Close. Now I'll come in and take my scissors and I'll start getting rid of segments of the original vector that was there. And that removed most of it. I still have a little bit here to deal with so once again I'll exit my line tool and I'll draw a box around the majority of this vector that I created. And you see it highlighted all the little broken bits. And I'll click Delete. I did not draw that box around the complete vector because it would delete this vector. So now I'll come over here and do this end. And anything that it got selected has been deleted. So I've already got a straight line there. Now I want to do this curve here. So I'll come up and I'll draw a circle. I'm not sure what the diameter or the radius is and it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to draw a circle out to approximately the size I think would fit this curve and click close. Then I'm going to zoom in here and kind of using my cursor right and left keys and up and down keys, I'm going to come in and move this around until we get to something that approximates this curve. Now if I need to increase the size, I'll select it again, hold down shift so I'm increasing the size from the center. I'll bump it out just a little bit, then I'll move my circle. Kind of zoom in here. See it needs to go over and cross this 
straight line that we drew right about here and then connect in this area here and we'll zoom in and see it does connect that's good enough so I can deselect that circle then come along and trim I'll get rid of the outside of my big circle come in here and trim that away which got rid of most of it then I'll trim away where I went beyond here now I've still got a little bit of a tail here and that's fine we'll fix that pretty quick right now we're trying to get the overall shape into the software again I'm gonna come along and trim I'll select that little bit right there close draw a line this way which selects that last little piece and tap delete now I have a, a straight line here it has a little bit of a curve right there so I'm going to come back to draw polyline I'll zoom in and kind of connect right here then come out here to where that curve would be and click again then come down beyond where that joins right in here and click come out here hit my space bar so I have this line now connected here and then again come back in and trim I'm gonna go all the way around this entire pattern and do more or less the same thing everywhere combination of trimming drawing circles adding and trimming and taking away So what we're left with now is this edge here down on the bottom. Before I traced this onto the paper, I took a little bit of artistic license 
and I kind of made a couple of curves here. I didn't want some big curve jutting out, and I didn't want a flat piece. I wanted something that looked a little bit graceful. So I figure these are going to be probably 20 inch, somewhere between 18 and 20 inch radii here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom way out. And I'm going to create a circle on my XY zero point with, I'm going to start with an 18 inch diameter, or excuse me. Yes, I'm going to start with about an 18 inch diameter. So that would be a nine inch radius. So we'll go ahead and make an 18 inch diameter. We'll create it. I'll close that. I'll select it. And I'm just, again, interested in one little segment of it over here. And 18 may do it. Let me get it placed down here. I need it to join up here. Then bring it over slightly. I'm going to have to extend this line. And that's why I drew this one so big. Because I'm going to create another one down here. Now I'll go ahead and trim away the majority of that circle. Now I'll draw another circle, the same. Close that. Select it. Select it again. Bring that down over here. Zoom in, and I keep zooming in to scoot over because this is proportional. The closer I zoom, the finer adjustments are made. So the less this moves. And again, I'm using my cursor left and right keys. I still need to close this vector, so we'll select all of the pieces, come up here to join, and we will have one closed vector after the join. Now we have our closed vector. This is our outside profile. Almost. We still have a little bit of modifying to do to this, so to do that, I'm going to introduce a new tool and that is the fillet tool. And a fillet is an easy way of rounding off these inside corners here and giving it a more smooth, graceful look without coming along and having to zoom way in and draw a bunch of uh, circles and trim those away. Now, I use the fillet on small, on a small radius like this, a fillet would be the wrong thing to do on a large radius like this. It's mainly for smaller corners where you want to round something off and not spend a lot of time doing it. Now we find the fillet tool over here under Edit Objects. The third row down, it's the first one. And this will create a fillet between the two spans. What we're going to look at for a fillet is a tool radius. I'm going to be cutting this out with a 1 8 inch bit. I'm going to be doing the profile with a 1 8, 1 8 inch bit. So the radius of that bit will be a 16th of an inch. I'm going to try this 16th of an inch and see how it looks. If I think I need a little bit more of a round off, I'll undo it and come over here and change this. But for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a normal fillet to round off these inside corners. And we'll come over here and we'll start up at this top left corner. Now you see what my cursor looks like. I've got a plus sign with a curve. If I bring it up here into the corner, into a corner that a fillet can be applied to, you see that check mark appears. That tells me that that corner will work with this fillet. So let me go ahead and just click and we see it kind of rounded off slightly. It's no longer a square corner. Now I think it needs to be rounded off a little more than that. So I'll hit Control Z to undo that change and I'm going to come in and change that to 0.125 
and we'll check that out, see how that works. I got my check mark. Now I've got a little bit more of a radius there. I think I like that a little bit better. So I'm going to go with that one. Now I'm going to come down here to the bottom corner and see how this looks with a eighth inch radius. I've got my check mark. I'll click on that. Oh, that's much nicer. There we go. That's much nicer. Now I have to be careful because I do want some sharp outside corners and inside corners. I want these corners here to be sharp. I want a slight fillet here. I don't want to go that much. Let me come up here and see what this one looks like. That looks okay. This was a sharp outside corner. I'm going to leave it that way. But I do want to smooth out that corner there. So it didn't do much. But now instead of having a jagged sharp corner, I have a slight curve there. This was a sharp corner. And I'm going to leave it that way. This up here was not. So I will come up into this corner, give it a little bit of a fillet there. Same there. It didn't do much. Nope, it won't. Now, this is okay to do. This was a sharp corner. This was a sharp corner, but I don't know that I like it that way. So let's try that. I think I prefer that. I am going to leave this sharp outside corner there, or inside corner there. The tool will leave a radius anyway. So, we're leaving that sharp corner. We've rounded off this corner and this corner. So, that is the, ra the fillet tool. You can change a tool radius up here and click on an angled corner to round off that corner without having to do a lot of drawing circles and, and trimming and going back and forth. Now, it should not change our vector. It should still be a closed vector, but I'm going to double check, and it sure is. We now have a, we have a closed vector, and that's our outside profile. So all that remains now is to clean up these holes here. And the simple way of doing this is to just draw circles and then delete these original vectors. So I'm going to come up here to draw a circle. And these holes in the crossbar that I'm going to be pegging it into are an eighth inch diameter. However, where has caused the holes to expand. So a 1 8 inch diameter dowel will be too big. I'm going to go ahead and go with 3 16 of an inch for my diameter here and change all these out and then I will drill the holes in the crossbar to fit a 3 16 inch dowel. So I don't right off the top of my head remember what the decimal equivalent of 3 16 of an inch is, I'll use the built-in calculator. Then I'll type 3 slash 16 then tap the equals button on my keyboard, and there's my decimal equivalent. So now I'll come in and let's go up here and do this one first, and I'll come to about the center of that vector and click. And that's going to give me a 3 16 inch hole right there. Then I'll move on to the next one down here. Now I can close, come back down to this one here, and I can kind of move it around a little bit. And that needs to bump up slightly, come over slightly. And that That's about right. So now I can just select this, delete, select that, delete, and I now have a clean hole there. Those are our vectors. All in all, not counting mistakes where I accidentally deleted a vector and had to go back and fix it, 
this whole operation took approximately 25 minutes. Well, it's not necessarily easy work, but it is simple work. The whole point of it is to create a pattern for missing material, trace that pattern onto a larger piece of paper, scan that paper into the computer, then do a bitmap trace. Then the grunt work starts with coming along and cleaning up those vectors. Now, in some cases, as I just demonstrated, it would be a monumental waste of time to try to clean up the vectors. It's better just to use those vectors as a guide to draw brand new vectors. I'm now ready to calculate toolpaths. I'll go ahead and demonstrate that. Uh, first, I'm going to group all my holes. So I select those two, hold down Shift, select all of my holes here. And I'll go ahead and group them. So now if I select one, I select them all. Then we'll come over to our Toolpath tab, and I'm going to pocket these out. My start depth. It will be zero. I want it to start at the surface of the material. And for my cut depth, I want it to go all the way through and slightly beyond. So I'll type in Z plus 0 0.005, then tap the equals button. It's going to go five thousandths of an inch beyond the depth, the thickness of my material. For my end mill, I'm going to use an eighth inch end mill. Uh, I will clear the pocket offset, which means it will spiral in to clear out this material. And I will t name this mounting holes. Calculate that tool path. It's warning me that it'll cut through the material. Click OK. We'll preview that toolpath and holes magically appear. Close. Go back to my 2D view. Select my outside profile. And I'll use a profile toolpath. Again, my start depth will be zero. I will type in Z plus 0 0.005. Then tap equals. Again, I'm going to use an eighth inch end mill. However, for the holes, I'm going to use an eighth inch up cut to clear those chips out of there. For the outside profile, I'm going to use an eighth inch down cut. So there will be a tool change involved. I'm going to machine my vectors to the outside. I am going to do a separate last pass with an allowance of 0.1. I will add tabs. I'm going to make them half inch long, quarter inch thick. I'm going to make 3D tabs. I'll come over here and edit those. And I'm going to put a tab here. I tend to put my tabs in long flat areas where I can sand them off easily. I'll put another one here. And I'll put another one here. That'll, that's more than enough. That will hold that in nicely. I'll close that. Uh, I'm going to ramp in with an eighth inch bit. I'll ramp in over a distance of one inch. I'm going to use a smooth ramp. I want to make sure I have sharp external corners here. And I'll name this profile cutout. We'll calculate that tool path. It's warning me that it's going to cut through the material. And we'll preview that tool path. And here is the simulation, the preview of the treadle for a mid 1800s Norwegian spinning wheel. And here is the finished treadle cut and in place. It is not uh, permanently installed. I'm waiting on some 3 16 dowel so I can do that. 
Then I get to spend a little bit more time on the finish sanding and then attempt to stain it to match the finish of the wheel. All in all, it was a fun project to do. And if you followed the entire tutorial, you now see the steps that it takes to go from something like that to something like that. I think that the owner is really going to be pleased with it. So that's it. That's how you take a bunch of broken material like this, make a pattern, and turn it into something like this. Now, I still need to get the finish sanding done on this, and we're, then we're going to attempt to get close to the color of the stain that's on that wheel. I made this out of quarter sawn oak because I had this piece, and I thought it would look ni nice on this wheel. Uh, near as we can tell, that probably didn't have any oak on it at all. But one thing weird about these Norwegian wheels, or not weird, unique to these Norwegian wheels, is they tended to be painted, mainly because they used so many different types of wood to build them, but also because they wanted something special, so they'd bling it up quite a bit. So this one isn't painted anymore. It's been stained and varnished, and I'm going to see if I can't do my best to match that finish. So about all that's left to talk about is starting with this video right here. I'm going to start a new tradition, and that is at noon today Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I will be hosting a live Q&A on my YouTube channel. Now, those of you who are subscribed and have uh, hit that bell button and got the notifications, you already know it's scheduled. I'm going to do a Q&A on this topic in this video. And I'm going to start doing this every Sunday when a new video goes live. So if you're catching this after the fact, yet one more reason to subscribe to my channel and hit that little bell button next to the uh, subscription button so you get notified when I post a video, when I go live. So that's today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on my YouTube channel. And I'll, we'll start then and we'll go until either YouTube kicks us off or we run out of questions. So I hope to see you there. I hope you got something out of this video. I really do. I know it was a lot of information and I know there were a lot of time lapses with music which people don't really like. That was the only alternative I can come up with. This is such an involved subject that when I cut together my first edit, it was about an hour and 20 minutes long. And in, ain't nobody got time for that in the words of the internet prophet. So I had to pare it down somehow. And that was the best way I could figure out to do it. So that's another reason for the Q&As. I'll read your comments that I've received on the video. Then I'll take your questions in the live chat and we'll see if we can, you know, get everybody's mind straight and together on the topic at hand. I also like to apologize for the construction noises in the background of some of this video. Um, building a house across the street and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. All that's left for me now is to wrap this up by saying if you'd like to follow along with my further CNC adventures, I do hope you'll subscribe to my channel and click that little bell button right next to the subscribe button. Then you'll get a notification when I either post a video or go live for a Q&A. I hope to see you live today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and again, as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I want to thank you very much for taking the time, the long time, to watch this video. Y'all take care.